Hello, welcome to this presentation by the Bay Area Association of Kidney Patients. Our topic today is clinical trials in you, and our presenter is Tony Rodolfo Benson, RN and MSN. Tony has been working in the clinical research field for over 18 years, where she manages and oversees the operation and the conduct of clinical trials globally. She is currently working as a director at a biotechnical company in Alameda that is focused on developing drugs and helping find cures for different kinds of cancer. Prior to that, Tony worked as a registered nurse in the oncology department at Alta Bates Hospital in Berkeley and at the emergency room at Kaiser Walnut Creek. Please enjoy this presentation by the Bay Area Association of Kidney Patients. And thank you, Tony. So, I know we can't hear you clap, but welcome, Tony. We appreciate your coming to speak to us today, and we look forward to this presentation. Great. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you for the introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining me today. It is a pleasure to be here as I work in the clinical trials uh, field for eight, over 18 years. And it has been my passion. And I really enjoy and love my, uh, my job. And to be able to share with you my knowledge and experience about clinical trials is, uh, is a pleasure. Now many people know about clinical trials. And so I'm really happy to impart um, some knowledge today. And so um, before we start, you know, this is clinical trials, a new webinar. And some of the questions I know that we will try to answer today is what are clinical trials? How do you find a clinical trial? And what, how do you participate in a clinical trial? So before I start, I just putting up disclosure here that um, I'm conducting this webinar as an independent person and a volunteer member of the board of directors for BAAKP and not as an employee of uh, my company, Exalexis and any drug company. Before we start, I do have a few questions to ask. So there will be a window that will pop up in front of you. We're going to take a poll. And the first question is, what is your favorite ice cream? I know that's not clinical trial related. It's just an icebreaker, but just wanted to see what choices, uh, what uh, is your favorite ice cream? Chocolate, vanilla, strawberry, mint, or Rocky Road? Okay. I see some answers getting recorded now. So chocolate and vanilla is, is uh, starting to, to win. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll here and share the results. It, this is hilarious. Uh, chocolate and vanilla are almost tied. <laughs> uh, my favorite, ultimate favorite is Rocky Road. So I have to put that option there, but Definitely chocolate and vanilla are one of the, the, are the, are equal and they're tied. So thanks for answering, humoring me and <laughs> answering that question. So now I do have another question to ask everyone. And again, just uh, answer the question. There are no right, no right or wrong answer. And uh, my question is, how much do you know about clinical trials? You know, just be honest. Again, there's no right or wrong answer. I just wanted to gauge the knowledge of everyone here so that I can um, tailor my webinar. None, very little, some knowledge, and I know a lot. Or if you're an expert, help me present this webinar. Okay. All right, answers are still being recorded. But I think we can, ha we have a kind of a big, um, I'll share it actually here. <laughs> we have a good um, amount here and majority has very little knowledge about um, uh, clinical trials. And that is my purpose here is to help everyone know more about clinical trials. And uh, the last question I have is, um, Participation in the clinical trials. Have you ever participated in a clinical trial before? And just simply answer yes or no. Okay. And the result is a resounding no, 79%. 
And we have some that answered uh, yes. And uh, I'll be curious at the end of this webinar to see your experience and what kind of clinical trials you've attended um, or you participated in before. Okay, well, thank you so much for answering the, the poll uh, questions. Okay, so let's go ahead and dive into the webinar. What is a clinical trial? Clinical trials are a type of research that studies new tests, treatments, and evaluate their effects on human health outcomes. They're sometimes called clinical research or clinical studies. It has led to the discovery of every disease treatment prescribed today. Study volunteers play a critical role in this process. People of all ages can take part in clinical trials, including children. People would have to volunteer to take part in clinical trials to test medical treatments such as drugs, surgical procedures, radiological procedures, medical devices, behavioral treatments, and so much more. My experience is mostly in clinical drug trials, so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. People of all ages can take part in clinical trials, including children, but you just have to find the right clinical trial to participate in because not every clinical trial will allow people of all ages. Usually there's an age range depending on the trial. You know, they, it may just be for pediatrics or there's an age range, age range from 18 to 70 years old or 18 to 90 years old. It depends on the clinical trials. Clinical trials are carefully designed, reviewed and completed and need to be approved before they can start. And we will go over that in more details in the coming slides. So why are clinical trials being done? Many of the reasons, there are so many reasons why clinical trials are done. One is, is it safe? Um, is the drug safer? Sometimes there are already some other drugs out there um, and we're trying to compare if this new drug is safer than the, what is already in the market. Is it effective? And is it more effective than the other drugs in the market? And for which population? Sometimes some drugs are already approved for adults and we wanna find out if the, the same drug will be effective for, um, you know, for children. I know that many people have learned so much about clinical trials um, during the last pandemic, I mean, during this pandemic, um, as uh, you know, vaccines are being developed, you know, people learn about so many terminologies and you know, FDA reviewing them. And now, you know, we know that the COVID vaccine have been approved for adults. And so now they just recently tested them in, in different age range for children. And so again, you know, they, they wanna know and their clinical trials, this, this is how it's being done. And some of the things too that they wanna look for are people living longer. You know, so many years ago, you know, breast cancer is being treated by chemotherapy alone. And we know that chemotherapy has a lot of side effects, you know, losing hair and so many other toxic side effects. And now with advancement of clinical um, treatments like immunotherapy, it has lesser, some of them have lesser side effects. And so, and are people living longer? So those are some of the questions. It's clinical trials brings a wealth of information where the, whether the drug is brought to the market or not. Only, this is a fact, only one out of 10 drug candidates successfully passes clinical trial testing, regulatory approval, and make it to the market. Only one out of 10, that's only 10%. And a lot, some of the reasons that they don't make it to the market is that 40 to 50% fail because they did not produce its intended effect on people. Sometimes they're just not effective despite all the, you know, the tests. Around 30% were due to manageable toxicity or side effects. 10 to 15% are due to poor pharmacokinetic properties or how well a drug is absorbed by the body or removed from the body. And 10% fail because of lack of commercial interest and poor strategic you know, planning. But it's still worth it to do these clinical trials because without clinical trials, there will be no hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis machines, no kidney transplants, no tacrolimus or cyclosporin, no medications to treat all the diseases and ailments and no devices to make our life more comfortable. 
Clinical trials are conducted according to a plan called protocol. This protocol is a very, very long document. You will not gonna see this document because a lot of times it's like 100 to 200 plus pages. And basically this document is, um, you know, describes what is going to happen during the clinical trial. Who are the patients that the clinical trial is going to, um, to test? Is it, you know, um, kidney patients? Are they cancer patients? And what type of cancer? The specific schedules and procedures that are going to be done, are there going to be blood tests, you know, to, measure, to check for, for patient safety? Are there going to be CT scans involved? What are the drugs involved, the, the dosages and the amount of drug that is going to be tested? The length of the study, and are there going to be comparators? You know, sometimes they compare, you know, what is already in the market in a new drug, for example, tacrolimus. If there's a new drug that is, that the company thinks that is more effective and more safe than tacrolimus, they might test that against tacrolimus. Um, how many patients will be involved? And where are, where's the trial going to take place? Is it only gonna be in the US and is it going to be all around the world? What the researchers hope to learn from the study and many, many more. So volunteers participate in the study must agree to the rules and terms out, outlined in this protocol. Similarly, researchers and doctors and other health professionals who manage the clinical trial must follow strict rules by the FDA. They must follow this protocol to the T's and the I's. These rules make sure that those who agree to participate are treated as safely as possible. Like I said, you're not gonna see this document and a lot of the terminologies anyway will be probably not understandable for somebody not in the medical or scientific field. But what you will see is a document called informed consent. And I want to take that back too. Sometimes they also provide the, um, the informed consent summary. You know, companies would provide this informed cons I mean, uh, protocol summary, and sometimes that is available to the participants. And so, but what you will see and what you will really be able to bring home and look at is the um, document called the informed consent. And we'll go over that in a little bit here. So what is an informed consent? The informed consent provides you with the key information about the research, everything that I was saying about earlier that is included in the protocol, and it will help you decide before you take part in the trial. The research team, the doctors and the research coordinators provides an informed consent document that includes details about the study. And this information is going to be in layman's terms, somebody that can understand um, even if you're not in the medical profession, if you're even if you're not a research scientist um, in a, I think like third or eighth grade level, you can take this document home. And if you participate, you will need to sign this document. The informed consent process um, is the process of providing you with all this information. And the process continues throughout the study. So if you decide to participate now, and then you're continuing to participate and do the, the study. If there's new information about the clinical trial, about the drug that is being tested, that information is by law needs to be provided to you. And so you will get a different version of the informed consent um, that any time that there's a new information, for example, in the original consent, you will be given information like, oh, this drug causes diarrhea, causes um, nausea and all these things based on new information because they're continuing to test this drug. And then based on information, there's new side effects. Now it causes headaches or it causes edema. It is your right to know that. And so again, the, the research team, the next time you visit the, um, the clinical research center, the research team will provide you with a new informed consent to review and sign to see if you still, you're still okay to proceed with the trial despite of the new known side effects that have been identified. If you do not, if you do not understand English or you know, your English is poor um, or you prefer a different language to, to read the, um, the informed consent that is also available this documents are translated 
into different languages, especially if they are conducted in different parts of the world, and especially in the Bay Area where we have a lot of um, you know, Spanish speaking, Chinese Mandarin speaking um, people, we can also um, translate those. The research team provides an informed consent document that includes the details of the research. And again, um, they explain the risks, potential benefits, um, and you can take this document home, like I said, read it, talk with your family, talk it over with your primary doctor, and ask as many questions as you can. And this in, informed consent too is revocable. If at some point in the clinical trial, you decide that I don't wanna participate in this trial anymore, you can get out of the clinical trial and any time with no questions asked and, um, and that is your, your right. So who conducts this clinical trials? So there are different organizations. There's organizations such as pharmaceutical company, biotech, medical device companies. And then there's the federal agencies such as the National Institutes of Health or the US Department of Vener Veteran Affairs. Um, and there's also individuals like doctors and healthcare providers. And where are clinical trials conducted? They can be conducted in hospitals. They can be conducted in clinics, medical centers, universities like UCSF, um, federally funded or industry funded research sites like the VA, they do have clinical trials. So again, they can be in independent research facility or in some of these um, medical centers. Clinical trials starts um, in, you know, the conception really starts in preclinical research. Um, and we know that uh, a lot of these starts in the lab. Drug discovery starts in the laboratory and before a drug is tested in humans, animal drug testing is conducted. This is where drug com companies first determine how a drug or a combination of drugs affect the body before it is even tested in humans. They wanna make sure be that before the first human um, is test uh, humans is uh, receive this uh, the drug that it is safe. Um, this is where they find the safest dose to start and what possible side effects to look for. Is it safe enough to test in humans? And then once it starts, it, it passes the um, the preclinical research. It goes into the phase one trial. The researchers test a drug or treatment in a very small group of people, usually around 20 to 80 people for the first time. And the purpose is to study the drug or treatment to learn about safety and identify side effects. If a safe dose is found and it's generally safe for, uh, for humans, then it is uh, the treatment goes into the phase two trial. Then the phase two, the new drug or treatment is given to a much larger group of people to determine its effectiveness and to further study its safety, usually around you know, up to several hundred volunteers. And then you know, the length of the study is about several months to two years. Once it passes the phase two trial, now it goes to a much larger phase three trial. The new drug is usually given to a larger pool of people, usually around 1,000 to 3,000 people to confer, to confirm its effectiveness, monitor side effects, and then compare it with the standard or similar treatments and collect information that will allow the new drug or treatment to be used safely. And you know, again, just referencing the, the, the vaccine clinical trial, as we know, that went really fast. You know, it's um, it went faster than the usual process, but at the same time, there were so many people that received the vaccine. Um, so many people volunteered for it um, in, in many, many, many thousands of people. That's why it went into the, you know, it, it, it was uh, approved so quickly. And for some clinical trials, it just depends on the protocol. It depends on the population that they're um, seeking to treat. And, uh, you know, because sometimes um, the patient population may not be there, especially if the, the disease um, is not as, as common or their criteria for entering the clinical trial is a little bit more stringent. You know, sometimes they test um, much sicker patients and sometimes it's those patients you can find only um, that are, you know, in the hospitals or um, uh, at home. And then there's a phase four trial. 
even if a drug is already approved by the FDA and made available to the public, researchers track its safety in the general population. So they try to seek more information about the drug or the treatment's um, benefits and optimal use. Are clinical trials safe? Protecting the rights and safety and welfare of the people are, is the number one priority in conducting clinical trials. The FDA oversees clinical trials to ensure they are designed, conducted, analyzed, and reported according to federal law and good clinical practice regulations. Each clinical trial sponsor, um, and when I talk about sponsor, that means you know, the, the biotech companies, the pharmaceutical company, or even a physician who's trying to um, you know, do the research, they submit a protocol to the FDA. And then the protocol um, is reviewed and making sure that, you know, again, um, it's within the, um, the guidance of the regulations. The FDA has 30 days to review the protocol. They can review, I mean, they can approve, flat out reject, or sometimes they provide feedback to the sponsor if they think that you know, the, the protocol needs to be changed or they need more clarification as to the conduct of the clinical trial. In many cases, sponsors meet with the FDA representatives even before they submit the protocol to discuss the, you know, the trial so that they know already what the FDA is thinking about their trial and they can modify it. And before they even submit it, they know what FDA's feedback was going to be. And then there's also the in Institutional Review Board, also known as Independent Ethics Committee, Ethical Review Board, or Research Ethics Board. This is a committee that applies research ethics by reviewing the methods proposed for research to ensure that they are ethical. And so there's the keyword there is the ethical and the IRB, the IR, primary purpose of the IRB is protect the, the rights and welfare of human subjects involved in clinical research, not only at the beginning of the study, but throughout the duration of the trial. The IRB or IEC is to make sure that the trial is conducted in an ethical manner. For example, in clinical trials, there's going to be um, you know, lab tests because they wanted to make sure that your kidney functions, kidney liver functions, CBC are doing well. And so they're gonna monitor that. And you know, depending on how many visits they, may, they think that you should be um, doing, that how many uh, blood tests you should be doing in this clinical trial, sometimes I, IRB will say, you know, you're collecting too many blood samples. You need to make sure that the patient is not, you know, um, being collected unnecessarily. Or if there is a trial that exposed the patient to too much radiation um, because of, you know, repeated x-rays, they can also say that, you know, too much x-rays, we need to reduce that or too much contrast if a patient is going to be exposed in CT scan. Um, you'll also notify, notice that I'm kind of sometimes using participant, patient, subject. I, they're all uh, in this, you know, they kind of refer, refer to somebody, the same pe person, which is the subject of the clinical trial, the participant of the trial, or the patient. So sometimes I happen to use them interchangeably, but they're the same. Um, and then there's also the Independent Safety Monitoring Committee or board. So now this group plays a vital role in protecting patients enrolled in a clinical trial from harm. These are independent experts, they're physicians, and sometimes they also include biostatisticians. Um, and they are not employees of the company, not employees of the pharmaceutical company or the, you know, the biotech company. And um, they're not affiliated, they are independent, and they are hired to provide independent monitoring of safety in a timely fashion. They review every side effects that each of the participants have experienced, and collectively, they analyze this information. Depending on the data that has been collected, they can tell the sponsor if the trial can continue enrolling participants without any changes to the design of the trial, um, they can ask the sponsor to change some aspects of the trial if they're concerned about safety, or 
they can ask, they can basically tell the sponsor that they need to halt the trial, especially if they feel that safety of patients are being compromised. So there are so many safeguards in, in, in doing clinical trials, um, and these are one of them, some of them. Um, before I continue, I just wanted to remind everybody that there is a, um, you know, a question and answer uh, uh, function on Zoom that you can enter your question. So please feel free to enter, uh, enter any question that you may have at any time and I'll, you know, I'll be happy to answer those questions. In my next slide here, I just wanted to touch on briefly the evolution of ethical and regulatory framework of human subject protection. And there are, you know, the, the Hippocratic Oath. Um, there, again, there's, there's so many things, so many events in our history that has shaped the medical science and clinical research landscape. And the Hippocratic Oath is the ethical framework for human subject protection, which has, you know, have um, ha origin in the ancient times. And it specifies the primary duty of a physician to do no harm, to avoid harming the patient. However, this oath was not much respected in human experimentation and most advances in protection of, for human subjects had been a response to human abuses during world, like in World War II. And the first international guidance on the ethics of medical research involving subjects is the Nuremberg Code, which was formulated in 1947. Although informed consent for participation in research was described around 1900, the Nuremberg Code highlighted the absolute importance of a human subject consenting voluntarily to any experiment. And there's that keyword there is to, um, to consent voluntarily. And if you're familiar with the thalidomide tragedy, this was a, 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 an event that, you know, that happened in, um, in many years ago, uh, many decades ago, that the thalidomide was first marketed in Germany for anxiety, trouble sleeping, and morning sickness. It was initially thought to be safe in pregnancy. However, concerns about birth defects pulled the drug from the market in Europe when children were being born without limbs. Uh, they have problems with eyes, urinary, and heart. And thankfully, our own FDA prevented the drug from entering the U.S. market, and that saved a lot of children in our country. It also helped the U.S. pass the 1962 Kefauver Harris Amendments, which strengthened federal oversight of drug testing. In 1964, at Helsinki, the World Medical Association released specific guidelines on the use of human subjects in medical research. This is known as the Helsinki Declaration. Like the Nuremberg Code, the goal of the Declaration of Helsinki was to prevent human subjects from being mistreated. The Declaration provided guidance for physicians who were conducting clinical research and focused on researchers' roles and responsibilities when it comes to protecting human subjects. And you've probably heard of the Tuskegee study. This was in the 1970s that was conducted between 1932 and 1972 by the United States Public Health Service and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. This was conducted in nearly 400 Ameri African Americans with syphilis. The purpose of the study was to observe the effects of the disease when untreated. Though by the end of the study, there have been medical advancements and syphilis was practically treatable. The, the men were not informed of the nature of the experiment and more than 100 people died as a result. This reinforced the call for tighter regulation of government funded research. This Tuskegee study is probably the most um, the worst case of an ethical human subjects um, research in the history of the United States. And because of this, the US National Research Act brought the requirements that human subjects in research must be protected and set the stage for the issuance of the Belmont Report. The lessons learned in the Tuskegee study helped shape the ethics of um, human experimentation. And lastly, in 1996, the International Conference on Harmonization published Good Clinical Practice, which has become the universal standard for ethical conduct of clinical trials. These, you know, these are just some of the events and defining moments in protecting people in, 
in clinical research. Um, again, you know, this is just some of them. There's so many other events and other updates, but these are the main ones um, that I, oh, I am so sorry about that. I'm gonna go back. And these are just some of the events that has shaped our um, medical and clinical research. Okay, so I talked about the FDA regulations regard, uh, relating to good clinical practice and clinical trials. And these are just some of, if you go to the FDA website, you will see all these links and these are just some of them. And you'll see that the FDA regulates a lot of things, you know, and not just, you know, the ethical and the protection of human subjects, but also protection of your privacy. There is a regulation about electronic records. Um, this is the, 21 C CFR part 11, making sure that anybody who's working in the clinical research, the doctors, the nurses, um, the sponsors, making sure that they're protecting your data. And so, you know, in this part of this CFR is really being able to make sure, you know, that there's passwords on, on databases, you, username and password and um, simple as that. But at the same time, you know, it helps with uh, protecting electronic medical records. Um, there's also the financial disclosures where they're monitoring if a physician has vested interest in the clinical trials that's being conducted by a, uh, a sponsor. Um, good laboratory practice, making sure that you know the, the, the labs are being that are being used are following the regulations. And the most important thing too is the protection of human subjects using the informed consent, which I already um, talked about earlier in the slide. Some I, I do have a question here. Thank you, Martha, for the question. Some volunteers for clinical trials are paid to participate and what determines that? I actually have a slide for that. So hold on to that question and we'll go over the, you know, getting paid in clinical trials. Okay. So I know these are what some of the important questions to ask. Um, what are the benefits of a clinical trial? There are the benefit, one of the benefits of uh, participating in a clinical trial is that you may get a new treatment for a disease before it is available to everyone. And so, um, you know, some uh, trials that are being tested, if, you know, again, just like in, with the, I, I would all reference the COVID, um, the COVID vaccine because so many people got the vaccine even before it was available to all of us. And, you know, you get to get that treatment before um, everybody else does. Uh, you may play a more active role in your own healthcare. Researchers may provide you with medical care and more frequent health checkups as part of your treatment. Um, some of these uh, clinical trials will ask you to come in to the clinic every three weeks or every two weeks, every month. And even when you're done, they're gonna ask you, they're gonna call you, um, you know, after 30 days, after 121 days to, do, to see how you're doing. And so you're gonna be, you know, visiting the clinic and they're gonna test your blood or whatever other test uh, checkups that they have more frequently than what your primary doctor would, would do. You may have the chance to help others get better treatment for their health problems in the future. The clinical trial may not benefit you per se, but again, with all the, um, the information that they're gathering, they're learning new things, it will provide um, knowledge uh, for the future. And you may be able to get information about support groups and resources that you would normally not get um, uh, anywhere else. I have another question here. Um, what would be a reason for someone to seek clinical trials? Are those wishing to participate rejected and why? How does a person find about clinical trials and how would the patient know about clinical trials? Uh, I have that in my slide too. So I will come back to your question in a little bit. Okay. So um, what are the potential risks of a clinical trial? The new treatment may cause serious side effects or be uncomfortable. And that's just um, the truth. And 
you know, it depends on the on the drug that are, is being tested. It depends on your response to the drug. The, the side the side effect may be mild to you know like mild headache, or it can range to severe um, uh, diarrhea. Again, it it or even it may even result in hospitalization. It just depends on the clinical trial and the side effect of that of the drug that is being being tested, and that is the risk. Um, but the doctors, the investigators are making sure that you're aware of before the clinical trials start with that informed consent, it has the collective information of every known side effect to that drug that they are testing. When I say known, it's the ones that have been um, reported when they do in the clinical trial. So side effects that they that has been reported from phase one, to phase two, to you know, and then if this is a phase three trial, all those side effects are collected in this informed consent, and you will be um, become aware of what those are because they're all going to be listed. And like I said, if there are new side effects, they will um, provide that information to you as soon as it is available and approved by the regulatory board to be released for your information. Um, but you will know that those side effects. Um, the new treatment may not work, or it may not be better than the standard of treatment, and that is just the, um, the you know, that's what they're trying to learn uh, during the clinical trials. Is it effective or less effective? You may not be part of the treatment group or experimental group, um, and that gets the new treatment. For example, for a new drug or device, you may get the placebo. Um, and so you're not getting the, the treatment. And unfortunately, that is also a reality that you may get, but you also may get the treatment. If you don't get the treatment, you may not know it until later when they're, um, until at the end of the trial. Um, and then the clinical trial could, inconvenience, in, could inconvenience you. For example, medical appointments could take a lot of time. Um, like I said earlier, you're gonna visit the clinic, um, the research clinic more often than you would normally see your doctor. Um, it could be every other week or it could be every three weeks. Um, you might need to travel to the study site several times um, or even stay in the hospital. So it's good to know about the clinical trial that you're going to uh, participate in offhand. Um, and I'll stress that in, in, in a later um, slide that uh, knowing what the clinical trial is about and um, everything about the clinical trial is gonna be very important. What are your rights as a clinical trial participant? Here's, you have the right to know everything about the clinical trial and you will be asked to do and what, what else that you will be asked to do in that clinical trial. Um, you have the right to know the risk and possible benefits of being in this in the clinical trial. Your right to ask questions at any time and how many questions you wanna ask. You will be given a lot of time to think about it, to ask questions, keep asking questions. Um, and you have the right to know who will have access to information collected about you. You have the right to keep your identity confidential and how it will be protected. Many companies um, and uh, research centers, they have, they are, you know, they have to comply with the regulations and make, make sure that your identity is confidential. Your name will never be used um, during the research. The only your, the clinical doctors will know who you are and you will be given an identity uh, number um, and that number will be your, um, basically your, um, how they will be able to tie you and that's being kept at the clinical research center. So the sponsor will not know you um, and uh, your, your identity will be confidential. Even um, date of births are protected. So anything that is, um, you know, regulated or uh, covered by the HIPAA is going to be um, covered. You have the right to leave the study at any time. So any time you feel that you don't want to be in the clinical trial anymore, you have the right to withdraw at any time, no questions asked. So who will oversee my care in the clinical trial? It will be what we call the principal investigator or the study doctor. 
um, each research sites, um, like I'm using example UCSF, they will have, um, for example, this clinical trial on kidney transplant. For example, there's going to be a, a physician who's going to be the principal investigator. And the principal investigator has signed a, um, a contract with the um, FDA. There is a document um, that we call the form 1572. And the, that investigator is signs that contract of that they are responsible for the clinical for the conduct of the entire clinical trial in his um, institution for the clinical trial. And so the principal investigator is going to be overseeing your, um, your trial and that there's also sub investigators that are that we call and those are also physicians that work with the principal investigator. There's going to be the research staff, you know, the, 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 the nurse, if there's an infusion nurse, if it's a, an, an IV infusion drug that is being tested, there's going to be an, an infusion nurse, there's going to be a study coordinator, and the study coordinator is the one who coordinates all your visits and all the, the testing and everything that you, that you want to know about the trial, who will call you to remind you like you have a visit coming up soon. And so, um, and also all the other, um, and there's a, you know, people that entering data for the research center. And one of the questions too is, do I continue to see my regular doctor, and that's the resounding yes. Um, there's no reason for you not to see your regular doctor. As a matter of fact, it's good that you know to keep your doctor and to keep your doctor well informed of what's going on with you, and the doctor knows that you're participating in a clinical trial. So here's the question um, for Martha: Do I pay? Do I pay to join a clinical trial? What are the costs to join a clinical trial? And do I get paid if I join a clinical trial? You do not pay to join a clinical trial. And um, there are costs to joining a clinical trial. Um, some of the patient costs are the doctor's visits, hospital stays, standard treatments, medications. But these are costs covered by your health insurance. And it's also covered in clinical trials. These are what we call the standard of care. These are what normally um, your insurance would pay anyway to make to, as part of your standard of care. And so if you go to your doctor to get CT scan um, to you know, check your, you know, your, your kidney or cancer or whatever disease, um, these are covered by your health insurance where you know, Medicare or other things. Um, are those, uh, and then there's the research costs. Are those related to the clinical trial? Those research costs are related to the clinical trial itself, such as the medications that being tested and extra tests and exams. So these, these um, costs to do the research, like I said, sometimes you have to go in for lab tests more often. And so if it's outside of the standard of care, then those are the tests that's being um, paid by the, you know, the sponsor, the pharmaceutical company. Um, and often, again, like I said, those are not covered by insurance, but the sponsor or the, um, uh, the pharmaceutical company will pay for those. Um, I did have a question here. If the patient is selected for the clinical trial, will the clinical trial team review directly um, patient doctor? Sorry, I'm not, if you can clarify that, Phil, um, if the patient is selected for the clinical trial, will the clinical trial team or review with the patient doctor? Um, you can, like I said, if you have, um, you know, when you receive the um, informed consent, you don't have to sign it right there. A lot of times people will bring home that informed consent and they can take as much time as they can to review it, to talk to their family about, to talk to, to your primary physician, if, um, you know, to get their, you know, their uh, take on joining the clinical trial. So you can talk it over with anybody you want um, when you get that um, informed consent. And again, ask as many questions as you can. I hope I answered that question. Um, I know someone who is in the clinical trial for Alzheimer's, they pay for transportation to the clinic. And I think more. Um, let me get on that. Um, is this here? Actually, I think this is the, um, okay. So 
if will I get paid for the clinical trial? Is the, the, the answer to this depends on the specific clinical trial. So some sponsor offer reasonable costs, um, reasonable compensation for the time and effort of participating in the clinical trials. Again, it depends on the clinical trial. You, when you do um, go to the clinic before you participate, these are some good questions to ask, um, you know, if they're going to pay for transportation, because in, in some of the clinical trials I know that I've, um, that I've managed, we, you know, there's, if they have to stay at a hotel, we pay for hotel. If they have to travel by Uber or by train, by plane, that has been paid by the sponsor too. Um, it just depends on the sponsor and it depends on the clinical trials. Um, these, uh, again, these are good questions to ask um, when participating in a clinical trial. Um, so, what is a placebo? Uh, a placebo is a pill or liquid or powder that has no treatment value. It is often called a sugar pill. Um, they're gonna look exactly the same as the treatment pill. Um, and it's just that there, there's no, um, you know, it's just sugar pill. In clinical trials, um, experimental drugs are often compared with placebo to evaluate the treatment's effectiveness. Is there a chance that you may get a placebo? And and yes, yeah, especially if you're you get randomized um, or you get um, you know you get put in this uh, in the in the, the trial where and I'll talk about randomization here in a little bit. If you get happen to be put in a in a in the group that that takes um, that will be given placebo, then yes, you will get the the placebo. Um, and many like cancer treatments as well as other clinical trials um, and other, you know, with ser serious side, with serious and life-threatening condition, using placebo is not ethical. Um, and so, you know, sometimes they're, they're not even gonna use placebo because again, they wanna make sure that um, patients are, um, you know, getting treatment. So a lot of times, um, especially for the, if the patient populations are much sicker, they use either, um, you know, the, um, the, the drug that is being uh, tested and they, they will use an active um, compar comparator that is already in the market. Like I used an example of tacrolimus earlier. If there are patients using tacrolimus, um, you know, this is a, the, the drug is already in the market, but if the, the company or the sponsor is testing a drug that they think is better than tacrolimus, much safer, um, in, you know, in their, um, as, as they've already, you know, tested in, in the lab, um, then they will, what they will do is design a treatment where they're um, comparing tacrolimus with this new drug to see which one is more effective. Um, so ask the trial coordinator, ask the research team whether there's a chance, um, if the clinical trial has at least placebo, ask them if what are the chances that you're gonna get placebo. Sometimes it is a one-to-one, -one, um, meaning, for every person that they randomize, one gets placebo and the other one doesn't. Um, again, it just depends on the, on the clinical trial. So what is randomization? Um, randomization really is basically the process of assigning patients by chance to, to groups that receive treat, different treatments. Um, you can be assigned to a group um, that has treatment and the, the, the group that um, assigned to a placebo or a different um, experimental drug. It is as simple as like flipping a coin practically, um, but they use, uh, they use uh, at the, at the, um, in this um, time and age, they use computerized randomization instead of flipping over coin. Um, it is uh, in, the sim in the simplest trial design, the investigational group receives new treatment and the control group usually receives um, standard therapy. Um, at several points during the trial or at the end of the trial, researchers uh, compare the groups to see which treatment is more effective. And the, really the, the, the purpose of randomization is to help prevent bias. Um, bias occurs when a trial's results are affected by human choices or other factors not related to the treatment being tested. And what does blinded mean? I know this is um, something that also you'll see in a clinical trial. Blinded means that um, blinded studies are designed to prevent members of this research team and study participants from influencing the results. They blind the information so that you know the 
pharmaceutical company doesn't know like, oh, you know, um, the patients, all the patients receiving treatments is, uh, you know, or our, our treatment is, is uh, doing well, you know, they, we don't, we don't really want them to see that right away because you want to, um, you know, you, you want to collect all that information first at the end of the trial before the, um, the data is uh, presented. Blinding allows the collection of scientifically accurate data. In a single uh, blinded study, you are not told what is being given, but the research team knows about it. In a double blind study, I, neither you or the research team would know. So even if you ask your um, research uh, staff, it's like, hey, do, I, do you know what my treatment is? They, they wouldn't know because they're also blinded. Only a, what we, they, they have a dedicated um, unblinded pharmacist that will know because the unblinded pharmacist is the person that will be dispensing the drug. So um, they need to know what treatment you're gonna get. And members of the research team, such as the pharmaceutical companies, are also not told which participants um, are receiving um, in order to reduce bias. And if medically necessary, however, it is possible to find out which treatment the participant receiving if there is if a, if a subject has been hospitalized and they need to know, you know, what's causing the patient to be hospitalized, um, they, that may be a reason for the unblinding, as we call it, to happen. I just wanted to put a little here about diversity and inclusion um, being important in clinical trials because this is something that is really, um, it's great because these, um, a lot of companies, FDA has um, mandated a lot of the com you know, uh, sponsors to do this now to making sure that not only, that, that, that there's diversity and inclusion in clinical trials. Um, we know that um, you know Caucasian people are are okay with participating in clinical trials, and some of um, minorities are still hesitant in participating in clinical trials. And I talked about the Tuskegee study earlier because that's been quoted um, in many many talks. Um, and discussions about clinical trials because there's still some sometimes some distrust in um, in in the clinical trials uh, field, and so there's a huge effort in increase, increasing diversity and inclusion um, in in clinical trials, and, uh, and I'm glad that I'm able to you know do this uh, uh, webinar because again it's an important aspect of medical and science that we should um, you know. Uh, include um, other nationality, uh, other races in, in the trials because not everybody reacts to the same way to, to drugs. People may experience the same diseases um, differently. It's essential that clinical trials include people with a variety of you know, lived experiences, living conditions, as well as characteristics like race, ethnicity, age, sex, and sexual orientation. Um, again, it is uh, something that is uh, um, exploding right now, which is great because where there's more, um, uh, you know, promotion of, um, you know, adding more diversity to clinical trials. Um, so what happens when after a clinical trial is completed? So the researchers carefully examine information collected during the study before making decisions about the meaning of the findings. Um, after clinical trials completed, the researchers making sure um, that they, you know, they have the data and those are, um, you know, submitted to the FDA. Uh, results from clinical trials are often published in peer-reviewed scientific journals. Um, so if you uh, have seen, you know, in in yeah, news in the NBC sometimes or on, on a news outlet, they'll talk about research uh, findings and these are already, you know, um, peer reviewed scientific journals as well. Um, you know, it's good um, to know all this information. And once a new approach has been proven safe and effective in a clinical trial, it may be, it may become a new standard of medical practice. So this is the question that we asked earlier, how do you find a clinical trial? Um, one is you, um, you know, gather the details about your condition. You find clinical trials and I have some links here. And the, one, of the link, one of the places um, that you can find clinical trials is uh, clinicaltrials.gov. And I'll share that with you in a little bit here. 
Um, you can talk to your doctor about clinical trials. And um, I know it's cliche, you can Google it. <laughs> the Googling has a, has a lot of information uh, to find clinical trials. You can also go to institutions. Um, you know, you go to ucsf.gov or .org. Um, you know, you go to hospitals um, website and uh, you, you'll find you can also go to support groups and, um, you know, the support groups may also find some uh, um, clinical trials. Um, take a look, closer look at the trials near you. Uh, contact, and then once you find one, contact the people running the trial. Um, if you contact the sponsor, you can go to their website and there'll be information there that um, they will tell you that, you know, for example, Pfizer, if you go to Pfizer's website and they have clinical trials um, on diseases, then they'll tell you that, you know, that um, you know, who to contact. Um, or if you go to clinical trials, clinicaltrials.gov, um, you can look at the, there's a filter there. You can look at, um, you can select kidney disease. Um, any type of base of um, kidney disease, and they will normally have information there where you can contact the, the trial team. Um, and then, and then I, like I said, ask a lot of questions, talk with your doctor, and then um, make an appointment. So what questions should, should I ask if I offered a clinical trial? Um, ask about their study. You know, ask a lot about study risks and possible benefits of that clinical trial, participation in care, personal issues, costs. Um, you know, ask them what is the purpose of the study? What do the researchers think the approach, um, may, if the approach may be effective? Um, who will fund the study? And who has reviewed and approved the study is, is a good question to ask. Um, how long will the study last? What, are, will, what will be your responsibilities if you take part in the clinical trial? And uh, what are the possible and, you know, side effects, benefits, like I, like I said? And um, again, there's so many questions that you can ask and I can provide you um, all this information too after the, the webinar. Um, consider taking a family member or a friend along for support for help in asking questions um, and, and recording your answers. So take a note, take notes down, write down all the answers, um, plan what to ask for, uh, but, and, but don't hesitate to ask any new um, questions. Write down the questions in advance to remember them, them all. Write down the answers so that they're available when needed. Again, when you're given the informed consent, you can take that home and you can write on it, um, you know, and ask, questions um, and you might have, you, once you come back, you will have to sign a, a clean copy for their records because the uh, informed consent is gonna be part of their records that will be audited, uh, potentially audited by um, the regulatory body um, in the future. But ask a lot of questions. So why participate in a clinical trial? When you volunteer to take part in clinical research, um, you will help doctors, scientists, and researchers um, learn more about the diseases and treatments, and you will help improve healthcare for people in the future. You know, there will be, you know, if you've noticed um, if from many decades ago, there has been so much advancement in, in medical science um, and, you know, treatments, new drugs or combination of drugs. There's, there are new ways of doing surgeries, uh, new medical devices, new ways to existing treatments, and it's constantly changing. New ways to change behaviors to improve health and new ways to improve the quality of life for people with acute and chronic illnesses. Okay, we have come to the, um, you know, near the end of my presentation here. Um, and I do have, I, I, you know, let's see, I, I, I'm, I'll open for another, a more question and answer before I take a poll. Um, I do have a question here. Um, my husband died a year after the clinical trial was successful and was given the new medications to him. What could be a cause of this? Unexpected, of course, if his death, just curious and more. Again, it, it, it depends on the, the disease of your husband. Um, it depends on the medications that he's taken and it depends on the clinical trial that he participated in. So I can't really 
um, you know, determine what would be the cause of this. It's a, I don't have all the information, that, uh, but this is probably a good question to ask um, your doctor and the, um, the team, the research team that uh, you participated in the clinical trial. Um, I hope I answered most of the question. Uh, what would be a reason for someone to seek clinical trials? Okay, I, I didn't answer this yet. Are all those wishing to participate rejected and why? How does a person find a clinical trials? Would you know, would, you, would the patient know, how would the patient know about clinical trials? So um, the first question, what would be a reason for someone to seek clinical trials? It depends on the person. It depends on the situation. Um, it depends on the, you know, the disease of the person. In some cases, uh, this is just an example, um, you know, cancer. Um, some people have exhausted, um, you know, all the treatments that is available in the market. You know, they've done clinical chemotherapy, they've done um, surgeries, radiotherapy, or they've done um, immunotherapy that has been um, in the market or, you know, that has been approved to be in the market. And, um, you know, if the person um, is willing to, you know, uh, do clinical trials and the person um, uh, finds a clinical trial that the person thinks, um, you know, for let's use breast cancer as an example, um, you can go into, you know, clinicaltrials.gov and look at all the clinical trials out there. And then you can look at where, you know, if you find a clinical trial for your, for that person's disease, and, um, you know, there will be inclusion exclusion criteria there. And these are the, you know, the, the, um, what the, you know, they're trying to test, right? What the, what the, um, what the age and the, the disease of uh, the type of disease they're using, doing the clinical trials on. If that person thinks that, oh, this is a clinical trial based on this information that I could participate in, um, then they can you know, contact the team and look at where they're being conducted. If there's one near you, um, in, for example, in San Francisco, then that person can contact, um, I'm using UCSF as an example, or can contact UCSF if they have that clinical trial. Um, are those wishing to participate rejected? And yes, yeah, sometimes they are rejected because again, um, each clinical trial has a sp specific criteria of what they are testing the, you know, the drug for. Um, they, you know, in terms of the, you know, for example, um, kidney disease, if the clinical trial is uh, for end stage renal uh, disease, and the person wants to participate, and but not, but not in, but the, the disease is only you know early stage. Then that person cannot attend in, or the, the person cannot participate in the um, in the clinical trial. Again, the criteria are very strict and um, very particular to a certain population, um, so they can be rejected in a clinical trial, or sometimes they fit the criteria. Um, when and this is this this happens many times, and they're just ready to participate. In the clinical trial, unfortunately, um, something changes in that person's, you know, body. Like their um, their their lab test, they all of a sudden their, you know, hemoglobin went down, and so you cannot be anemic to participate in the clinical trial. So um, the doctor has to give you medications to um, to uh, resolve that anemia. And if that anemia is not resolved, then you cannot participate in that clinical trial again. Um, it's, it's, it's very strict. Um, again, you can find out clin about clinical trials in uh, um, clinicaltrials.gov, hospitals, um, uh, you know, uh, resources like the NIH. I'm sorry, I haven't <laughs> mentioned the NIH is a good um, website to look for uh, clinical trials as well. Um, another question I have here. Uh, as the widow, I just heard that I can ask the finished results after his death, where can I ask them? Um, you have been given information um, in the informed consent. If you still have that document who to contact for the, um, the clinical trials that you participated in, the investigator's name should be there or somebody from the clinical research should have the information on who you need to contact if you have any questions. So contact um, the, the person um, to get, you know, to get your, uh, to ask them for, to uh, answer your questions. And if you have any um, information that you want to get from them. 
Um, they will they give this to me even though he is returning six years of debt? I'm, I don't know. So um, again, ask your, you know, ask the uh, clinical research team if they can get that information to you. Because at a certain point, they have to archive those information. And I don't know what um, their policy is in archiving those information. They may still be able to, to get it for you, um, but I, I can't answer that question. Um, okay, anybody else has any question? Let me look at the questions here if I haven't answered any of them. Oh, you're welcome. You're, you're very welcome. Okay. So interesting, Tony. Yes, great. And then um, I just have another uh, poll question to ask. And let me get my polls here. Sorry, this is before <laughs> the clinical trial. Okay. Um, I have another question to ask. And the question is trying to. How about that one? Okay, there you go. I am launching that question now. So now that we're finished the webinar, I want to know how much do you know now about clinical trials and um, get, giving you a few um, uh, moments here to respond. And okay, people are still answering. Okay, and I'm gonna share the result. So um, the result, Deborah, are you able to see that result? I'm able to see it, yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Great, um, so uh, there's uh, a 67% says a lot, I know a lot more and earlier it was zero. So I'm really happy that you know a lot more <laughs> clinical trials than you did. Um, you probably know more than you would want to know, hopefully not. Um, very little, some knowledge. The good news is that Deborah has recorded this webinar. And so if you want to you know, re, um, go back, if I hope I'm not talking too fast. And if you want to, um, sometimes you, know, you can only take so much in, in one session. If you want to revisit this, um, Deborah is going to be sharing this at the, uh, in the BAAKP -A -A website. So you yes. can re-listen to it again. Um, and I have another question. And the other question I have is, knowing what you know now, would you consider participating in a clinical trial if you know if it's something that you would that you would think that you would benefit from or you know um, want to know more about it? And there's no right or wrong answer. Um, you can say yes. You can say no. Again, you know it, it depends on people's comfort level. And um, yeah. Okay, I will, um, I've got some answers here. And the answer is resounding 78% yes. And I think, I think I did my job here by educating you about clinical trials. And there's no offense to these people that says no, and that's okay. Um, it, again, it depends on people's comfort. And yes, you know, um, again, if you, I'm glad that you are open, open to um, participating in a clinical trial, um, again, you may not only just, you know, may not be beneficial to you in the long run, but you will definitely help in, in clinical research in science and medicines advancement. Um, and, um, you know, great. Oh, I didn't share the results. Sorry. There you go. Okay. Um, let me see, going back to my slides here. And these are the resources um, that I have. And you know, you don't have to write it down. We're gonna, again, we're gonna be sharing this. And we'll also be doing this, um, putting something in our future newsletter for everybody's um, information as well, adding this um, in, the, in, the, in the newsletter. So um, you will have this information as well. But again, the FDA website, the National Institute of Health, the clinicaltrials.gov, uh, the Office of Human Research Protection has a lot of really good information. The World Health Organization, the National Cancer Institute, even if it's your, your disease is not cancer related, they really have a lot of really great resources out there. Um, and, um, you know, your doctor would know clinical, I'm sure that your primary physician would know about clinical trials as well, as uh, a lot of the physicians attend conferences, they, att they always um, 
that's this you know how they keep up with um, new treatments and advances in medicine is they attend this a presentation on research on clinical trials and so they would know about these clinical trials um, and you can always ask them as well so and to that thank you so much for joining and if you have any more questions i'm still here <laughs> thank you tony you did a great job we thank you learned a lot about clinical trials including myself i i didn't know much going in so great. i'm glad and we will post the recording on our website and we'll post that list of resources also. Sounds good. Thank you. <laughs> so that people can can watch this again because I think your this talk is so good, people will want to watch it again. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you to thank all you everyone. attendees also. We appreciate your joining us this afternoon. So with that, I'll I'll close off. I'll stop recording. And does any well before that, does anybody have any more questions? Let's give you a second to type. Okay. Well, thank you, Tony. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank everybody for attending, and enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Okay. Bye bye. Bye.